one miracle with Sharon started this whole thing. From Shirley praying for Sharon, one miracle started this whole thing. And it's the domino effect. We have no idea. So it's 1979, everything happened, and this little prayer meeting starts at the house. And I mean little, right? Little, little. It was uh, your dad, myself, you, and Shirley, Pastor Shirley. I remember uh, that after Pastor Chuck got saved, he was out to save everybody and to pray for everybody. And uh, Shirley Hart, our office manager, said to me, if you don't start taking a better taking care of your business, you're going to lose your business. Didn't bother him at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't understand what was happening to us, and she said, let's wait once a week, we'll pray, we'll read the Bible, and we'll talk. And then within a week, I got a phone call from someone that was, I hear you got healed, could I come, I need some prayer. And uh, she says, I'm bringing a friend with me. So they came the next Tuesday, and then somebody else calls, and they're bringing somebody, and pretty soon Tuesdays are filling up. And so we had to, uh, and they wanted more than once a week. Mm -hmm. So we set aside Tuesdays and Thursdays. Pretty soon we're renting chairs, you know, and we'd have up to 120 or more people on both Tuesday and Thursday. I took a trip down there to check out what was happening and I was amazed of, of what I found. Here were a couple that were so in love with Jesus. They opened up their home to a prayer meeting on a Tuesday evening, and I was just blown away at what was happening. The hunger of the people, uh, I saw deliverances, I saw healings. It was amazing. I had never seen anything like that before in my life. Uh, the passion people had for the Lord, the music was tremendous, I thought. I had never heard anything like that before. I had lots of religion in my life. I just never had a true relationship with God. Pretty soon, I mean, we there was so many people coming, and God was sending people to us. They were everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they were everywhere. Were, they were everywhere. <laughs> Your parents started that, that year. Yeah, early on. Yeah, yeah my parents started coming, and, and gradually because because mom she she knew everything that was going on in town and she went to school with with um sure. chuck and um everybody's going to the house to just see what's going on and so probably for my parents mom especially it was just curiosity like everybody else yeah what's going on here and then um they got hit and dad was wheeled in a bible all the time and <laughs> and brought us kids to church and stuff and mm -hmm and to the house and I remember early on you putting a call out you wanted to do like children's ministry and you wanted to volunteer and I was 13 years old and I thought well I can come early and do that so I know I you were my I, first yeah your first yeah. one I can remember we'd have to you'd have to rent chairs there were so many people there every week mm -hmm. set them up and take them out and we always had to have dessert after <laughs> oh yes in fact we we, we got tired we would just tell everybody, shut off the lights and lock the door. We go to bed, right? <laughs> Nobody wanted to go home. No, no, no. Um, Kathy Hawthorne gave a teaching that night that changed my life. It was just a sincerity I'd never experienced before. And of course, the night was topped off by many desserts. 
you know, some of them stay till one or two o'clock in the morning. I know. You know. I had school, school the next day. It's a school night, and the house is oh, filled with people. How old were you? Well, starting out, I'm like 12, 13, and I go to bed because I have school tomorrow, and once in a while, my door would just open. That's great. Somebody curious just walking around the house. You know, the house is filled with people. I went there. I drove around the block a couple of times to build up my courage, but it happened they had a big semicircle drive, and there's cars parked on both sides of that semicircle, and there were park cars parked out in front of the house and down the street, and I'm thinking, what in the world is going on here, you know? Anyway, I said, I'm going to go in. I wanted to see the movies. My plan was, this is my plan. As soon as the movie was over, I was going to get out of there. I was going to sneak out of there before any of that stuff could get on me because I was just too cool for that to happen. Yeah. Well, I started coming when we moved downtown, and uh, Pastor Chuck Sr. was a big influence on my life. Um, and started heading me in a direction that I needed to be headed. And we got started with sound ministry, youth ministry. Uh. And so I go to this meeting and the speaker um, was telling all the reasons why he had just left the Catholic Church. And the more he talked, the angrier I got. You got mad. <laughs> I was mad. You mad when she came home. And, and, uh, and, but I agreed with everything he said. I just thought, you don't have the right to say that. And I was so offended and so angry. And I, when I came home that night, I told Dave, I said, I am just angry enough to write him a letter. And he said, well, why don't you write him a letter? And I thought, well, why don't I? And so I wrote a two page handwritten letter explaining all the reasons why he was wrong. And I made the mistake of putting my name and address on the letter. <laughs> and the day he received it, he called me and um, of course then he explained everything and after 45 minutes and tears and prayer that's when he asked me about uh, what I when I come to the prayer meeting a couple days later and I said well I tell you what I'll ask my husband if he if he'll want to go then I'll go because I knew in my heart Dave never wanted to go to anything right. nothing well, nothing nothing didn't care. And I had been going to <laughs> prayer meetings and Bible studies and a glow and different things and was beginning to get some understanding of, of spiritual things. And I had gotten saved and had some court, sort of a spiritual language, but nothing much changed in my life. And so that night when I said, told him everything that had happened about the phone call, will you come to the to the prayer meeting and he without dropping a beat he said yeah i'll go and i went oh shoot now we're committed <laughs> now we have to go so i knew there was some kind of presence in the room didn't know what and then sister lucille started hopping around on one foot with her eyes closed saying I don't know what, I can't remember what, but I thought, you know, between her and Sister Ida, there's a whole lot more to this than what I was doing in the other church we were going to. There was a girl who was sitting right in front of me. She went forward, others were going forward, and by the time I realized what was happening, she was still right in front of me. I followed her right up. But he led us in a simple prayer of confession and repentance and asking Jesus to come into our house, our heart. Now, he's, like he said again, you invite him, he'll come. Well, I did, and he did. And I had a powerful, powerful salvation experience. I felt this, and I'm gonna use a deep theological term here, crud, leave me. And I felt, it felt like the heavens were opened up and I was being immersed in the love of God. I was just being flooded in the love of God. I had a pickup truck at the time and I told some of my friends back back home about what was happening at this prayer meeting. So I had a topper on that pickup truck and my girlfriend rode up front and I had about six to sometimes eight people in the back of that pickup truck that we went down to the, to the they wanted to experience the move of the Holy Spirit as well. So we went in the prayer room and I watched as they ministered to him and his whole countenance changed just changed and I'm sitting a few feet away in another chair and as they're praying for him I feel this ball of fire in my midriff and 
and it's like you said, everything cha everything mm -hmm. changed. Everything changed. Anyway, from that point on, every Tuesday and Thursday, they would open their doors, and I would be one of the first ones there every day, you know. And I became one of those holy roller of Jesus freaks, and I was loving every minute of it, you know, loving every minute of it. They were off the bat going to be open to whatever the Holy Spirit wanted to do. They wanted a church that would be free. Uh, um, Pastor Collie Scott and, and um, had called and said that God spoke that he's to come and ordain us that we're to start a church. <laughs> and this is in the middle of, um, of 81, right? Like right mm -hmm. in the middle. And so, you know, your dad, he just kind of laughed. He says, oh, Pastor Scott. I love business. I'm not interested in being a pastor. <laughs> I love what I'm doing. I love the prayer meetings. I mean, just minutes later, we hear from Mama G uh, Ida Gatewood from, she was doing a conference in um, Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And she said, Chuck, God just spoke and you, you need to get ordained because you're going to start a church. That's and two he, calls and that's how little, two, how quick? Minutes. Minutes. Just minutes. And he laughed, he says, Ida, I love you, but that's not gonna happen. <laughs> and very few minutes later, I mean, maybe five minutes later, my sister Charlene had gotten healed at one of our prayer meetings and she went back out to California and she's at uh, a prophetic conference. And she calls the, uh, whoever was speaking and I've got the book somewhere, I should look it up. But anyway, he's signing uh, autograph. She says, this is for Chuck and Sharon. He says, Chuck and Sharon? God just spoke to me about a Chuck and Sharon oh. <laughs> that have prayer meeting in their house and they're going to start a church. So she calls us on the phone and he's in the background saying, yes, God said. And after three, that close together, he sat down in the chair and just started weeping. He said, God, I don't understand. I can't do this. I don't know anything about it. And so we just kept going with the prayer meetings mm -hmm. until we could figure out what, what was actually happening to us. I didn't even know who the two of you were for a while. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I'm like 12 years old. You were in and out of hospitals my whole childhood. Mm -hmm. And dad was drinking a lot. I remember going into the hospital room to say goodbye to you. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you're sitting up and you're healed and you can see out of the eye again and dad quits drinking, and it's all Jesus all the time. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what was going on. Pastor Chuck and I became real tight. We were good, good friends, you know. But anyway, he pulled me aside one night at the house, and he said, you know, uh, Sharon and I understand what's going on, you know, but uh, I want you to pray. I want you to join with me in prayer. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, he said, you know, there's a lot of rumors, a lot of gossip, a lot of accusations, a lot of uh, nasty stuff going on, a lot of ridicule going on about what's happening right here in our midst. He said, we understand what's going on, Sharon and I do. He said, but, he said, and we're braced for it, but my son, he called his name Chucky. He said, but Chucky's a high schooler right now. And he said, he's in high school, he's a teenager. You know? He said, please, Ralph, join with me and pray, pray for Chucky. Pray for him that he will remain strong, that God will put a hedge of protection around him. And I said, I sure will. I, I, you know, I will. You know what? Look now, where's what's up, what's going on? Now he is the pastor of the church there at Grace Community Church. Him and the pastors of the church there. You know, God is a prayer honoring God. You know. So back then. 82, 83, 84, or later even, you know, what did a typical week look like? Well, once we um, realized that so many people were driving, especially from Pontiac, so God just led us to start a church in Pontiac. So eventually, here's, here's what a week looked like. Uh, we moved our Tuesday night Bible college to Monday night so that we could have Bible college Monday night, which when Bible college was going on, it was all day at the office and then evening classes. And then Tuesday night, we had um, services in Pontiac. Wednesday night, we had service in Streeter. Thursday night, we had Bible college all day and evening again. Friday night, we packed up the bus and we took um, 
everybody that wanted to go and minister in our worship to up by Chicago, and we would rent a room in a hotel, and we would have healing services up there, and then Saturday we'd go, <sighs> and then Sunday we'd have services back to back while we were finishing up in early service in Pontiac. As we're finishing up, they're standing at the door with donuts and coffee, and off we would go. We would get here, and you guys have already started worship, so as we would come in, worship was going on. Yeah. My story kind of began before I was even born, when my dad, along with some of his motorcycle friends, decided to go to a prayer meeting in somebody's living room. And that's where the seed was planted that began to break down the generational curses within my family. I uh, attended Rama Christian Academy here from kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, I met my wife Jen in high school, and now we both serve here at the church. Uh, my wife Jen is the nursery director, and I'm on the worship team. So I'm Kyle Chamberlain, and uh, I grew up going to Grace Community Church. My family landed at Grace in uh, the mid 1980s, and uh, I just remember here I was this this wild kid, uh, hyperactive. And uh, yet we found this place that, that welcomed our family. We were driving in from, from Oglesby, so about 30 minutes away. We were part of the many families that would come to the 1015 service. Uh, we'd worship together, and then we'd hang out and eat lunch. My mom would do the little um, sack lunches for us. We'd hang out and, and play, and then we'd go to the, to the 2 o'clock service. And it was such an amazing time in our lives. I know for me, that's when Jesus really became real to me. I received I received Christ in uh, in Super Church with Mrs. Brock, and then uh, had my first opportunity to minister and uh, to serve in Kids Church, and then the, to preach my first sermon when I was 15 years old. 15 years old because of Mrs. Hawthorne. There are so many people that have impacted my life. Uh, we came there because my dad started taking. Uh, Bible college courses through the, the Bible college that was running there at the church. Um, we were praying and God said, uh, yes, this will be Grace Community Church, but this is to be known as a worship center. And that didn't make much sense at the time. No, it didn't. It because our really worship didn't. looked a little different then. <laughs> yes. For as much as worship is at the core and the center of, of what we do here, um, it didn't always look like this. Matter of fact, I, I have something here. Okay. Um, before there were <laughs> video screens and technology uh, and overhead projectors, and we had something other than tape. Players. These these are the actual boards all the way back mm -hmm. from the house. Yeah. These are 40 years old. <laughs> We've hold on, held on to them, and this is what we would do. We would play cassette tapes with whatever worship songs we could find. Mm -hmm. And these were up on an easel. These were up on an easel, and we would flip these and pages. And you would flip them around. Yeah. She would. She would yeah. flip them, and everyone would sing and read them. Sometimes they'd land on the floor. <laughs> yeah. We still have all of these. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I know that song. Hold that one up. Which one? Oh, Worthy is the Land. Oh, which one is that? In, In Him We, we Live. How about this In the day? <laughs> yeah. Nice. So that's what worship looked like for a long time. And you have to remember, um, there was no internet, there was no YouTube, there wasn't the resources we have now, and all of these amazing churches and worship teams and... Um, Writers and... Yeah, there was none of that back then. Mm -hmm. And so we just had, eventually, CDs that we were playing worship music to. And I knew we had to have live music, and that was at a time when it wasn't popular to have a worship band. Um, and so how do we have live music? We have no musicians. <laughs> we had our own Christian band. We were mm -hmm. running around doing concerts and we were always playing and doing our thing. But I knew we had to have live worship at our church. And so I was praying, I was always praying, God, send us musicians. Mm -hmm. Send us talented musicians so we can have live worship. And, and he, he said? just he just wasn't sending live, <laughs> he just wasn't sending yeah. musicians. And then finally at one point, I know he spoke and he just said, just raise up what's already here. It's already here. Mm -hmm. It's within. And I thought, really? <laughs> <laughs> it's hiding. <laughs> we have the musicians here? I didn't know. I was excited to find out we had all these talented people right here in the church. Well, that wasn't what God meant. And so uh, 
I decided to go before the congregation with a proposal. And I basically, I got up in front of everybody and I said, we're gonna have a worship team. And if you've ever wanted to play an instrument, we're gonna start right now. So I need a drummer. Who wants to play drums? And a hand went up. Who was it? It was Chris. Chris Brock. <laughs> His hand went up. Our it drummer was... today. My recollection of how the worship team came to be was we're going to have a worship team was announced from the altar and then we had a meeting and we were looking for different people to play different instruments and somehow my hand went in the air when it came time for the drummer and I had never touched a set of drums in my life so next thing I, I can remember is we ordered a drum set and I was still living at home at the time I was probably 19, 20 and was cracking the plaster in mom's kitchen ceiling from because my bedroom was right above the ceiling and uh well if we're gonna have drums we need a bass player who wants to play bass more than one hand went up and it, and it started that way and we had this group of people who had never touched an instrument in their life which is fantastic which means they didn't come in with with egos and a lot of past experience we didn't know anything and we set a goal and my goal was that in six months we would play a song live for worship. And in six months flat, we played an entire service and never looked back. I can remember those moments when we eliminated all the pre-recorded music and we were playing live and we got to just spread our wings and fly during worship and it was almost like you soared into part of the heavens. It was uh, so amazing. And I got to be part of that and it will always be such a privilege. And I can't wait to see where God's going to take all of this because it's already gone so far, so wide, so high, so deep. And um, I know there's more. As a kid, I can recall uh, every service wanting to go and sit in the front row on the right-hand side to sit right by where the drummer Chris Brock was sitting so that I could play drums right alongside of him. You know, I went I would find anything I could to use as drumsticks. Oftentimes, I'd be taking broken drumsticks right out of the trash can just so that I'd have something to be able to play along right alongside of him. It's been fun. You know, my wife's in the worship team, too. You know, learning to, we kind of have our own way of playing together. That's, that's developed over the years. Well, we weren't married when this started, but uh, so I guess I met her through the worship team. Uh, praise nights, um, that one night a year that we would um, open our doors to the public to just come out and, and be able to participate and see what we do on a weekly basis here. All the, the giftings that, are, um, that people possess and, and have within them from dance to singing to um, you know, poetry, there were some skits um, that were happening and you know, we just were able to do that for the community so that they could be a part and see what, what we do each and every service here at Grace Community. We have a ministry called the Halal Dance Troupe, and it's an amazing ministry to be part of and to see how it was birthed. It's been 30 plus years that it was formed as a strictly Israeli dance troupe. And soon it evolved into interpretive dance, and um, we would do um, prophetic dance and every form of the arts, because the Bible says that Jesus declared that he would build again the tabernacle of David, where there was worship and singing and dancing, and all of those elements of praise and worship were there. And it's just been part of who we are as a church uh, to express all the forms of worship and all the, all the arts. And our mission statement is quite clear, and, and that is to, to express to the Lord that um, we want to worship him in every form that we can to give honor to him. 
so I've only been here for about eight years and um, to think about the previous years and what I've missed out I didn't get to see those praise nights I didn't get to be a part of it um, it makes me kind of sad but um, I'm also excited because of what I came into at the time that I came uh, for about the first um, two to three years I came for healing and um, I had a lot of stuff going on in my life and I just I just spent a lot of time letting uh, God and lots of women minister to me while I was here and uh, then I joined the dance ministry, and um, it was life-changing. I never thought that God would uh, use me at, uh, in such a great ministry as the dance ministry. I, never, I, I didn't experience that before coming to Grace, and um, it is a true sisterhood. We are there for each other, and we get to just portray God's heartbeat. You, you can't be in this atmosphere and in this room during this worship and, and not receive something from God. You're going to receive. It's going to hit you. Tell us after, after you were healed, before everything started, and you guys come home, and we're all home, mm -hmm. and you've had this transformation in your life now, and Dad wants it bad. He said, I don't know what you and Shirley have got, but I want it. And he went in, um, we had a, a library in the house, and uh, there was a small restroom right next to it, and he says, I'm going in here, and I'm not coming out till I've got what you guys have got. And we were trying to explain to him, you know, what it was and so forth and he said no I want this for myself and he shut the door and he locked it he was in that room for three days and three nights mm -hmm. and he'd come out to go to the bathroom and that was it I mean he stayed in that room and we we could hear we could hear him and it was just breaking my heart and I said surely we can't let this go on and on we've got to you know he's we've, he's got to let us in so on by the end of the third day we knocked on the door and yeah, we asked if we could come in. And you know, when, you, when somebody's crying, I mean, they, like me, you can't talk and cry at the same time. And we opened the door and tears were pouring out down his face. I mean, pouring, and, but he's talking normal. He's talking just like this, but it's like a flood of tears are just pouring out and cleansing. And we said, oh my God, what happened? And he said, um, and he's told this at full gospel meetings. Mm -hmm. He said, um, I was at the feet of Jesus on the cross and I looked up and his blood was pouring down on me. And, he, and the look on his face, I mean, I'll never forget it as long as I live. And he said, I told him, please take this from me. Um, he really felt he, he was an alcoholic at that point. He, he, he drank three quarts of martinis and two quarts of stingers a day. We prayed for him and he just kept staring out that we had a big picture window with a desk under it and he kept looking at the picture window and going like this and he said, there it goes. He, he, he said, we couldn't see it, but he, he said, I watched that thing leave me and go out the door over to where the edge of the street was, and it turned around and looked at him, you know, as if to say, are you sure? And he says, no, I don't want you anymore. Go. And it disappeared. And the man never went through withdrawals, never had a craving, nothing. And the only time he would talk about his alcoholism was if there was some it would help somebody else mm -hmm. but he said as, as far as he felt he felt like he'd never drank in his life mm -hmm. that's how clean he felt and instant in instant and he just had such a heart it, 
he, he never got to see Celebrate Recovery. He would have loved it. He would it. have loved it. And oh. he would have loved these people. And the very place we started that, in the other room, is where the bar was, and he used to drink there. Where he used to sit and drink. And we didn't plan that. We didn't even yeah. realize it till afterwards. <laughs> Just remember uh, thinking, wow, this is so different than church as I knew it before. Um, but as a kid, it was exciting. It was fun. Started going to Bible college and learning the word and got ordained with uh, Pastor Chuck, Billy Staff, and Tom Krieger, and Ralph Pollitt. And all the same day. It was kind of a neat day. <laughs> Life's changed that day. And uh, it just grew from there. We got involved in doing all things around the church. We got into the food pantry. Uh, the food pantry had already been started, but my wife and I took it over and it exploded. And it's been 40 years. So I'm Betsy Beckham and my parents are Dave and Teresa Brock. My brother is Chris and he plays the drums who is married to Angie McKinney, my sister-in-law who is sister-in-law of Lori McKinney, and it's just a whole... It's gonna sound a little country here. Um, my mother-in-law is Pastor Elaine, uh, whose daughter is Angie, the bass player, whose husband is Chris, the drummer, uh, whose parents are uh, Tr Pastor Teresa, and whose husband is Dave, who works in the sound ministry. And Chris's sister, so Chris the drummer, his sister is Betsy, who is in the dance ministry. Her daughters are also in the dance ministry, uh, Bella and Abby. Um, my daughter then is also in the dance ministry, Addison. And I joined the dance team at 16. Um, both of my parents are on the dance team. First generation, then second generation, and then my daughters are third generation, so that's... And I grew up in the church ever mm -hmm. since I was in the womb, basically. <laughs> Took uh, 12 or 13 teenagers up into the hills of Jamaica. What do you guys do there? Uh, we were up at the... We stayed in the mountains with Pastor Scott and Pastor Collins. So I got the privilege of staying with uh, Kathy Hawthorne and Amber, um, who now is Amber Hawthorne, um, in the house that had the single light bulb. And we would have to take a cloth and take <laughs> the light bulb from room to room. I remember, and we stayed at Pastor Collins' house, and they had no running water, at least for his house, there was no running water. You got to see little lizards and things running on the floor. It would surprise you. Uh, the chaperones that took us probably thought, what, what were we doing, taking these children up to the hills of Jamaica? But as a youth, it was a memorable but eye-opening to see um, how people lived. Uh, I remember when I first went off to Bible college, I was in this freshman level class and the professor there was probably like I don't know 100 150 kids and the professor asked one of those questions to try to try to stump everybody and I remember he asked the question I, I raised my hand I, no one else raised hand. I raised my hand and I knew the answer and he was shocked he said how did you know that and I can trace it back to being a part of grace and and the just the the hunger for the presence of God the hunger for the word that Pastor Chuck and Sharon instilled in me and being a part of all the ministries of the church. Uh, 2009 we had the, the wonderful privilege of taking a trip to Africa, a missions trip, um, really stretched me outside of my, my comfort zone, but we were able to take um, PA equipment and uh, 
dance costumes and props and all kinds of stuff with us and, and just bless them. And we had a week long revival healing service that we were able to lead them in worship and in teaching. And we were so blessed to be able to be part of and just to receive their gratitude and love that they poured out on us and um, had a lot of fun teaching the young people um, songs and scriptures and on, on rooftops of buildings and uh, they just they just ate that up and it was a wonderful uh, time for us to to share with them and um, just being able to uh, be there every night for worship and see miracles happen and and just uh, one of the couple of the days we were able to feed hundreds of people as they came and um, it changed my life it was something I'll never forget so it was a wonderful wonderful trip and I've been going to church here for 30 years so um, you know it's like a big huge extended family mm -hmm. for us that has helped us through every thing we've been through in life, good, bad, the happy times, the not so happy times. Yeah, our, our church here has definitely been our family. It's, we're beyond blessed with wonderful blood family, but the family that we have been blessed with here, we can't even put into words. You know, there's been times, like you said, they've, the people in our family here, they've been here for every event in our life. They're there for a wedding. They were there for the birth of our children. They were there for hospitalizations. They were there the night the business that we owned burnt to the ground. When pastor drove me to Pontiac. <laughs> they, they were there. And then the church family came together as a whole to help us recover from that, which was a huge setback in our life at the time. But God took that as good and turned it around. And we may not still do what we do for a living if it wasn't for our church family here helping us get through all of that. It's the gratitude that we have for our church family cannot be expressed into words. It's amazing what he's done in this church. It's the, the uh, bringing it from that little storefront to the acreage we're on now. Um, and the neat thing about it is fully paid for. There's no debt on this place. And that's what is just amazing. And it was all done by God. So it's so amazing to get to see the fruit of me being able to raise my family and serve alongside my wife in this ministry that all started from that one moment 40 years ago. With each addition, we would build things and we'd tear walls out and we'd add a wall and we'd tear another wall out, <laughs> added that sanctuary over there, eventually added this sanctuary and everything that we did was done by the people mm -hmm. in this church family. Yes. We did it all. Everything was done by hand, and we did it as we could pay for it, and that's part of what has maintained that feeling of home, mm -hmm. is because we did all of this ourselves. I know me personally, one of the greatest privileges of my life was the ability to be able to help with the sanctuary that we have here when we built that. It's a great honor. You know, one thing that when we were talking that I'll never forget one day, we had spent the day out here working, and Carrie brought the kids out for dinner, and we went up on the... Uh, balcony just to look over and I don't remember which kid it was but one of them said dad well why is this place so big and you know I just told him this this isn't for us this is for you and for your generation that what we're doing here is for generations to come because we're at the time when we're in the other sanctuary that was big enough for where we're currently at as a church but God had something in mind. God had something planned. And even uh, we've tried to instill that in our kids and the kids we've taught that we're always equipping for the next generation, that we're still doing what we need to do for ourselves and what God has called us in the present, but we're also preparing that next generation. And that's part of what we were doing when we built the sanctuary. And all these years later, we're now living that out right now. I remember growing up, hearing the stories of of people meeting at, at your you know, Pastor Chuck and Sharon's house and uh, the meeting at the little building and, and starting that church and, and all the stories and the memories and, and reaching the community and the miracles that God did in people's lives. I grew up hearing those stories and they inspired me. They, they stirred a, a fire in my heart. And here I am now, we plant a Vantage Point Church in California and God is using us to do things that, that are so far beyond us, but we trace it back 
to what was birthed in my heart as a little kid at Grace Community Church. I'm excited for the 40 years that have happened, but I am so much more excited for what God's going to do in the future through our church. Thanks for letting me be a part of it. Rama Christian Academy was a school here at Grace from 1985 to 2015. It taught students from K through 12th grade, sometimes preschool through 12th grade. With strong academics and biblical teachings, it um, graduated many students from high school who entered boldly into the world. And it was tuition free. Yes, tuition free, the church supported it. Pastor Chuck Sr. had a revelation that he didn't want only parents that could afford to send their children to the Christian school to be able to do so. So he called the school our church's mission field. And the person that held the reins in the school was our pastor, Kathy Hawthorne. She led us for the majority of the 30 years. She led the faculty and the students with compassion and with wisdom, and we're very thankful. I do not need to know God's plan for the rest of my entire life. The best thing to do is to ask that he shows me his plan just for today, one day at a time. We praise the Lord for the heroes of faith who came before us. We honor them as we too strive to build the kingdom of God. 40 years, that's amazing. <laughs> um, been here for a little over half of that and um, been able to see God move and do great things. And I am so excited and look forward with anticipation to what he's going to do in the next 40. Um, I'm able to, I've been able to be part of the worship team and the youth ministry for most all that, that time. And, um, you know, now as we are um, entering into this new season, um, we're able to, you know, do this with our families. Um, my daughter, Marissa, is on the worship team and, you know, it's such a blessing to be able to have her alongside me and, and do that. I think about it often and um, it's just a, it's a special thing to have that. I can look and see Marissa leading on the piano and then I can look the other direction and see Esri running the camera. It's just a huge blessing that our whole family yeah. is a part in some way. Yeah. That's our future. Yeah. How many miles do you think we drove? Oh, I figured that out too. <laughs> Between Pontiac. <laughs> Between Pontiac and Streeter, uh, at least twice a week for 34 years, about 400,000 miles on our car. And I think that's that's a low number. <laughs> so um, we've yeah. uh, we've put a lot of miles yeah. and worn out a lot of tires. It's and been, been worth it. It's yeah, worth Church it Alive too. is worth the drive, Pastor yep. Chuck used to say. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. I think we can certainly vouch for that. Yeah. So happy anniversary, Grace family. 40 years, and here we are. It's a long way from my parents' living room when I was just a kid to where we are right now, today, this morning, all together. We just want to say how much we love and appreciate you all. Uh, this is not just a gathering, but this is a family, and this is how we do life together, and what a privilege it is. And we're just uh, so proud of everyone and just want to say thank you, and we love you. And we can't even begin to scratch the surface of everything that's happened over 40 years and all the good times and uh, difficult times as well that we've lived through together, but very fond memories. And uh, if you're watching right now and you're with us this morning and you've just joined this family recently in the past few years and you're saying, well, I was never at the house. I wasn't in Jamaica. I wasn't there for all of these stories and when all this happened, um, I'm excited for you because you get to write the next chapter of this church family. You get to be part of deciding what the next decade looks like, what the next 40 years looks like. So I'm excited. So if you've just joined us, this is what you get to be a part of, a family doing life together for the kingdom of God. And uh, I'm, I'm certain that God has brought us right to this time in this place after 40 years. And I know there's nothing but great things ahead. And we all get to be part of that together. So thank you. And 
Let's carry on. Come Holy Spirit. Yes. Have your way. Amen.